عالم بلا صراعات ومجاعات وأمراض كيف سنتمكن من بناء مستقبل لطالما حلمنا به؟ سيتم الإجابة عبر حوار عالمي بناء that in the Muslim world also we've started uh, summits like this where ideas are exchanged, intellectual activities promoted. So I want to congratulate you, first of all. And then, before I start my uh, vision of governance in Pakistan, I just want to uh, uh, inform the audience here what what was an international sportsman, a cricketer? How did he end up in politics? And then how did he become a prime minister? So I think it will be interesting for you because then you will understand what I intend to do with Pakistan. You see, I grew up in Pakistan. I'm the first generation of Pakistanis. When Pakistan in the 60s was considered the fastest growing country in Asia. It was actually a model of development for the developing world. Um, I just met Sheikh Mohammed today and he again reminded me that Emirates Airline was helped by Pakistan Airlines in the, in the 70s. So Pakistan was a country with optimism, hope. We grew rapidly, we had excellent governance system our bureaucracy was one of the best in Asia, and that's the Pakistan I grew up in. So then I uh, played international cricket. When I started my international cricket, Pakistan was one of the weakest teams in world cricket. And we were emerging from colonialism. So we took great pride as our team became stronger and it competed. And by the time I left cricket, Pakistan was world champions. So I took pride, like my countrymen, as we competed internationally and we grew in confidence. Uh, but unfortunately, our country could not keep up that pace. Countries have, you know, life of a country is in cycles. It's never in a straight line. You go up, you go down. It's course correction, countries come up, some, some countries don't go up. So in Pakistan's case, we were going up, and then various things happened when we started our down cycle. So when I left cricket, I built, started building the first cancer hospital in Pakistan. Reason was because my mother died of cancer. And it's then I realized there was no cancer hospital in the whole country. And then it occurred to me that people like me who were well off, I could afford to take my mother for treatment abroad. But what happened to the common man? Cancer is one of the most expensive treatment. So I started this uh, uh, movement, really. I went into the public to collect money to build this hospital. And it's, so I'm just explaining to you how I got into politics. So one was cricket, watching our country go up as a cricketing nation, the pride that we could compete internationally and become world champions. Second was this cancer hospital. When I went to the public to collect money, I realized <clears throat> that we, our people, are very generous and strong. Poorest of the poor people supported me. And I did what no one ever thought would happen is that from public, I eventually collected money and built the hospital. And not just that I built it. It's, it's a cancer hospital where 80% of patients get free treatment. Cancer treatment is one of the most expensive treatments. So then first I built it, and then to run the hospital, I again went to the people. And so it is the only private cancer hospital in the world which treats 80% people free because it's the people who donate to the hospital. They built it, they run it. <clears throat> so I kept 
thinking, why is it that people are so generous to build a hospital and run it, but why don't they pay taxes? We were a country, and then I discovered we're a country which is amongst the top five countries in giving charitable donations. But at the same time, we are right at the bottom in giving taxes. And the reason was that people did not trust the government. They thought that their taxes were wasted by the government. It was spent on the lavish lifestyle of the ruling elite. So why would people pay taxes? And of course, then the levels of corruption, because corruption is basically stealing taxpayers' money. But there was a third reason why I ended up in politics. And that was, I watched, first of all, I used to play professional cricket in England, so half my year was in, in England and then half in Pakistan. Uh, and I saw how a, a, a developed country, how the institutions worked, why they went ahead, how, they, how the governments were accountable, how there was meritocracy, and above all, how there was human development, the money spent on human beings. So I could compare what was going on in, in Western countries, and then I could see what was happening in our own country. But then I also saw other countries develop, and one of them was UAE. I, was, I used to play cricket in UAE from 1980 onwards, and I saw UAE keep, kept, kept developing. And then afterwards, we saw China develop. So the common thing in all countries that have gone ahead is governance. And governance has two aspects. One is a government, a government has to be accountable. The more accountable a government, the more clean a government, the more successful it is. And secondly, I, I, again I repeat, is meritocracy. The better the system of getting the t best talent to the top, the better the country. Um, let me just give you a sporting example. <clears throat> Australia is the most successful cricketing country in cricket history of two, over 200 years. Because Australia has the best system of bringing its talent up. Pakistan, in my opinion, and I'm not prejudiced, I understand cricket better than probably everyone in this, in this hall. Pakistan has the greatest talent of all the countries I've played. I've never seen as much talent as in Pakistan. But we do not have a system of bringing the talent up. So what's the point of having great talent if you do not have a system of meritocracy which brings the talent up. And that's in every field. In the 60s, the re reason Pakistan went up, because our civil service exam was the toughest. It was the most, uh, all the young people wanted to go into Pakistan civil service. It was the toughest exam. We had the best talent that came up. And in 60s, the reason we progressed, one of the main reasons was a civil service of very high quality. And gradually, as our system of merit went down, so did the country. So um, I wanted to, uh, so I wanted Pakistan to go up. And I, as I said, I saw UAE going up. The way each, each year you came, it changed. It got better and better. And similarly, and of course, the greatest example is China. For me, uh, the the thing about China which is just remarkable, no nation in the history of mankind has done what China has achieved. In 30 years they have brought 700 million people out of poverty. It is just a phenomena which has never happened in human history. And of course my motivation again of, of the Pakistan I wanted to see was based, and I'm a student of uh, history, Islamic history especially, was on the Prophet, or Prophet peace be upon him, the state of Medina, which he created. Now, why do I say the state of Medina? Because the state of Medina laid the foundation 
of one of the greatest civilization in the history of mankind. The principles that were, that, that were, that found the, the, the foundation of the state of Medina is what for the next 700 years was the greatest civilization on earth. And what were those principles? The state of Medina was founded on incredible principles of justice and humanity. Uh, it was the first time a welfare state was made. A, a state that took responsibility of the weak. What China has done right now. That was the state of Medina where first time a state took responsible for its poor, its weak, its, its orphans, its widows. In the state of Medina, the first time pensions were created. Old people were also. It was a humane state. And secondly, there was justice, rule of law. These were the two main things. And the third thing, the prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, made seeking knowledge a sacred duty. The, the word was that even if you have to go to China to seek knowledge, you must. Those days going to China meant not coming back. So the emphasis on seeking knowledge. For the next 700 years, all top scientists were Muslims. And that was the state of Medina. It laid that foundation. And then the way minorities, other religious people were treated. The Prophet signed famous, uh, the Misak e Medina. There's still a letter in St. Catherine's Church which was signed with the Christians that your places of worship will be, till the end of time, they will be protected by Muslims. Secondly, that no forcible conversions would be uh, in Islam. Thirdly, the Prophet's last uh, sermon, it is a charter of human rights. It's about how human beings are equal. So it was a humane state created, rule of law, emphasis on education, that led to the growth of Muslim civilization. So this is, in Pakistan, that's, we want the same basis of our state. The rise of what I believe, the way our country will rise, it will go back to those principles. We must, number one, have rule of law, everyone equal before the law. State must be accountable. We must have a welfare state where the state must take responsibility of its poor people. Half our population um, is on the poverty line or just above, and about 25% are below the poverty line. The state must take responsibility. All, all uh, policies of the state must be like in China. How do we lift the people from the bottom? And what I, the, 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 the most important thing is that we must, in Pakistan, start a reform program. Reforms are painful, but it is essential if we have to uh, get out of our current problems. So, First of all, I joined politics in 96. From 96 to 2013, there was a very small party. Most of the time, it was one step up and three steps down. Uh, the first election, I contested, we were wiped out. Second election, five years later contested, we had only one seat. Third election, we boycotted, and every, most of the time, people made fun of me, thought we would we would never make it because I'm an outsider. I wasn't a, from the political class. But one big lesson from sports which I learned, you only lose when you give up. So, <laughs> so kept learning from my mistakes, kept getting up, falling, getting stronger. Eventually, we formed government in one of the four provinces in 2013. And it was the KP province which was devastated by war on terror. It was on the border of Afghanistan, uh, the, the tribal areas. The whole fighting took place in that region. Uh, the police was devastated by uh, attacks. Uh, we had 70% of industry closed. And KP is, has reputation that they only give you one chance. Each government comes once, it's ousted the next time. So we came in a coalition government and we started our reform program. First of all, we started spending money on human development, health and education. Secondly, 
we did first time in Pakistan history, no party had done before. We started spending money on climate change. Pakistan is about eighth in, in, in the countries that are most um, vulnerable to climate change. So we, we took this ambitious uh, uh, t uh, mission of planting one billion trees in five years. And then we reformed the police, depoliticized our police, depoliticized our bureaucracy, and then started uh, uh, tourism. Because uh, KP has uh, a lot of uh, uh, tourist sites. It, has the, the, it is, was the center of Buddhist civilization, so religious tourism but we have the best mountain scenery there. So anyway, by the end of five years, we had half poverty in those five years. The poverty had gone half. And a, 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 a province which never gave you a second chance, we came back with two-thirds majority in 2018. Not only did we win there, then we formed government uh, in the last election. We got 17 million votes, which is the highest ever won by a party. And so now, we have our reform agenda. And as I repeat, reforms are painful. You know, when you, when you take reforms, when you make reforms, people suffer. They go through a, a difficult time. It's like a surgery. When you conduct surgery for a while, the patient suffers, but then he improves. The worst thing that ha can happen to a society is that you keep postponing reforms because of the fear that you will have opposition, the vested interests will stand up, and you don't do reform. So we've started on an ambitious reform program. Uh, that's number one. We are trying to change our, uh, improve uh, all our uh, economic um, uh, policies. We have uh, uh, cut down, trying to cut down our fiscal deficit. We are trying to Im improve exports, cut down our imports. We have unfortunately had to raise bills because we came up with, when we, uh, when we got into power, we had massive fiscal deficit and uh, current account deficit. So, so we are doing that. But in my opinion, uh, Pakistan now has a chance. Already we are seeing optimism. Investors are coming into our country. We feel that this is the time that Pakistan will take off. The most important thing, and one, um, while talking to Sheikh Mohammed last time, he told me something very interesting. He said that you must allow businesses to make money. Investors must make profits. Uh, and the reason is simple. If uh, people don't come into business for charity, they come into business to make money. So the more, if they can make money, more people come and invest. So this is what we've done. We have started uh, working on ease of doing business, making it easier for people to do business, easier for the investors. We, have, we are changing our tax laws, which were very cumbersome. So we are, uh, we are conducting a series of reforms. Um, and already, we, have, we see the signs of the country improving. Uh, but most important, Pakistan has the best tourist potential. Uh, at the moment, we have hardly any tourism compared to other countries. But Malaysia, with, uh, with just beach tourism and resorts, Malaysia has $22 billion it makes from tourism. Turkey, with beach and historical sites, beach tourism, Turkey has $42 billion from tourism. Now, Pakistan has probably one of the best mountain scenery anywhere in the world. Half the world highest peaks are in Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan has 1,000 kilometers of uh, coastline. Pakistan has the oldest historical monuments, probably as, as old as anywhere in the world. We have uh, Indus Valley Civilization, which is 5,000 years old. We have uh, Peshawar, uh, the oldest living city in the world, 2,500 years. Lahore is and Multan, ancient cities. But what we have, probably more than any other, uh, hardly any other, other country has, is religious tourism. We have, uh, for Muslims, we have the Makkah and Medina of the six. 
The Sikh religion has the two holiest sites in Pakistan, and we have just opening those sites for uh, Sikhs, and we have opened up a, a, a visa regime. First time in Pakistan, we have uh, 70 countries which can come in and get visa uh, at the airport. We also have, I mentioned, I mentioned Buddhist civilization, uh, the Gandhara civilization, which was the cradle of Buddhist civilization, is, is in KP, north of Islamabad. Some of the ancient sites, the, the, the biggest sleeping Buddha, 40 feet, is, is in Haripur. Um, and, and then we have, for the Sufis in, Muslim, in Islam, we have some of the greatest Sufi, highest number of Sufi shrines all over Pakistan. So, so what we are doing is we are opening up the country. Uh, we are opening up for tourism, investors. Um, and I would like to finish my talk by saying uh, something else which uh, Sheikh Mohammed said. Sheikh Mohammed said, apart from this, this great thing which has stuck in my mind, that a businessman must make money. You see, what happened in Pakistan was people were making money. Then came 70s and we had a socialist government. When the so socialist government came in, everything went anti the big uh, business businesses. There was a nationalized. And the mindset of our bureaucracy and our politicians was that somehow making money was a sin. So now we are reversing the whole thing. We are now asking businesses that, look, we will help you in making money. Because the more money they make, the more investment will come. But the only thing is, the money, as we create wealth, that wealth will be used to lift people out of poverty. So we, we, we want an equitable growth. We don't want the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer. We, uh, I'm really against this uh, neoliberal economics where you have 62 people owning as much wealth as 3 billion people on this earth. I, j I think that the, uh, the distribution of growth should be equitable. But uh, the last thing I want to say about what Sheikh Mohammed I still remember, um, it's very important that to take risks in life. Sheikh Mohammed said that when 9-11 uh, uh, took place, the, the, um, he immediately called up Sheikh Ahmed in Emirates Airline and said, buy aircrafts and engines of aircraft because everything went down, no one, prices of planes went down, uh, people were uh, uh, not flying as much. This is the key, in my opinion, this is the difference between very successful people and people who don't take risks. I have um, played 20 years of international cricket. I saw a lot of players with a lot of talent, but they never made it big because they were scared of losing. They would not take risks. Be players with less talent, but that ability to take risks, chances, they, had, they, they also had bad times. But eventually, the ones who took more chances and risks were the ones who made it big. This is the time, my last word is to the investors, this is the time to come to Pakistan when it is just going on the upswing. This is the time to invest in the country. And don't miss the boat. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for this speech. Your Highnesses, ladies and gentlemen, Please join me in welcoming His Excellency David Beasley, Executive Director of the